Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you all today is a very recent one, but it was suggested to me by one of you guys and when I looked into it, I wanted to discuss it because I feel like we've been seeing so many of these types of cases recently of people using poison as a way to kill someone for one reason or another. And in this case, you will be shocked to learn how the suspect allegedly went about it. We do not have a conviction in this case as of right now because it is very recent and ongoing, but I do think we have enough to sort of put the pieces together and get an idea of what happened here. So, without any further delay, let's just jump right into it. Today, we are going to be discussing the tragic death of Betty Bowman. Betty J. Bowman was born on December 13th, 1990 in Wichita, Kansas to parents Nancy and David Sponsel. Betty went on to attend the University of Kansas School of Pharmacy, graduating with her pharmaceutical doctorate in 2017. After that, she completed her residency in Stormont Vale Hospital in Topeka, Kansas, finishing in 2018. After that, Betty worked as a pharmacist in Rochester, Minnesota. Those who knew Betty described her as being a very loyal and caring friend. She was exceptionally thoughtful and kind. She was seen as an inspiration to her friends who were always encouraged by her to live their lives to their fullest. She wanted to make sure that she lived her life to her fullest, taking every opportunity that she could to travel to new places. Her adventurous spirit took her all the way to Yosemite in California, which is somewhere I've always wanted to go. She loved visiting Chicago, New York. She visited the Grand Canyon, Hawaii, and then all the way to Iceland and the Caribbean. She was the proud dog mom of her fur baby, Sir Crumpet II, who was a corgi. She loved spoiling Crumpet with special treats and toys, and she took him to the dog park in any public space that allowed dogs. She also loved visiting local coffee shops shops, trying different cheeses, and making sure to spend quality time with her friends and family. On May 30th, 2021, Betty married her husband, Connor Bowman, in Independence, Missouri. Together, Connor and Betty lived in Rochester, Minnesota. Connor had also attended the University of Kansas for his medical degree, and at the time of Betty's death, 30-year-old Connor was completing his residency in internal medicine at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. The Mayo Clinic is a very, very highly regarded organization to be working for, and at least in my experience, only some people actually got to go practice or do their rotations or do their residencies at the Mayo Clinic, so that is an amazing opportunity to have. Meanwhile, he had also been working in poison control for the past six years, and Connor was known as a poison expert. Now, by August 16th, 2023, Betty was admitted to the Mayo Clinic's St. Mary's Hospital due to severe gastrointestinal distress and dehydration. Just before being admitted on August 14th, she told a friend that she had a few days off of work and wanted to spend some time with Connor. By August 15th, she told his friend that she had been drinking at home with Connor and also had a smoothie during the day. But that following morning, she told her friend that she was sick and hadn't gotten any sleep because she felt so ill. When she was admitted to the hospital, she said that she probably had been sick from food poisoning, blaming the smoothie she drank as the most likely culprit. So, once she arrived, the hospital staff started treating her for food poisoning. All of her symptoms were consistent with food poisoning, so it made sense. But Betty was not responding to the treatments typically used in food poisoning cases. She deteriorated rapidly. She started experiencing cardiac issues, fluid was starting to build up in her lungs, and her organs began to fail. At that point, Betty was taken in for emergency surgery where they removed a portion of her colon that contained necrotic tissue. At this point, the doctors who were caring for Betty were getting more and more concerned because this was starting to look like something a lot more serious than simply food poisoning. So while they were working hard to figure out how to treat Betty, of course, Connor was there by her side. As things got worse, Connor felt that maybe he had the answers. He told the hospital staff that he believed that Betty was actually suffering from hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis, or HLH. 
HLH is a rare disease that typically occurs in infants or young children and rarely in adults. It can actually be caused by genetics where family members pass down the gene that causes it, but there are other ways to acquire HLH, such as viral infections, especially Epstein-Barr virus, a weak immune system, or cancer, which also weakens your immune system. It is a condition where certain white blood cells, histiocytes, and lymphocytes start attacking other blood cells. These abnormal blood cells will collect in your spleen and liver, causing these organs to become enlarged and eventually fail. Symptoms of HLH include digestive problems, lung problems, jaundice if your liver has been affected, headaches, trouble walking, and rashes. So it can look similar to food poisoning or a severe flu, depending on how much it has progressed. This is a disease that doctors are still working to research, so it's not something that is immediately thought of when someone presents with these symptoms because, again, it is very rare and even more rare for an adult to have it. The great thing about the human body, and I'm being sarcastic here, is that so many vastly different diseases and organs and so many different body processes like to present very similar to each other. So sometimes it can take a very, very long time to get the correct diagnosis pinned down. And sometimes it can be difficult to make that diagnosis at all because so many things present the exact same way, even though they're completely different diseases or diagnoses. It's, it's crazy. So next time your doctor is having trouble figuring out what's wrong with you, give them a little bit of patience. Either way, while at the hospital, Betty's medical team did run diagnostic tests for HLH, but they came back as inconclusive. And unfortunately, after four days in the hospital and all treatments just not working, by August 20th, 2023, Betty passed away in the hospital. Of course, her death deeply affected her friends and family. Connor had alerted Betty's loved ones that she had died of HLH, and that was the cause of death listed in her obituary. Everyone was just dumbfounded and shocked that a healthy young Betty could have just suddenly died from natural causes like this. It was unbelievable. Now, after Betty's death, Betty's body was sent off to the medical examiner for an autopsy because, again, she was young and healthy, and there were some questions surrounding her official cause of death. However, Connor complained and said that he didn't want her to have an autopsy. In fact, he called and tried to cancel it. He said that she died from natural causes and stated that this isn't what Betty would have wanted. She didn't want to be a cadaver. She wouldn't have wanted to be cut open and studied like that. He was adamant that Betty be cremated immediately because that's what she would have wanted. Then he emailed one of the death investigators that worked with the medical examiner's office and asked if the toxicology report was going to be more in-depth than the one they did at the hospital. He also asked for a list of everything that they would be testing for. He wanted to make sure that they were going to be thorough. At the time, everybody knew how devastated Connor was. He had just lost his wife so suddenly and because of a condition that neither of them had any control over. However, there were a few people who knew the couple that believed that maybe this wasn't as cut and dry as it seemed. So, one friend only identified as an adult female with the initials S-E-L called into the Rochester Police Department to do an interview. She said that Betty had texted her while she was in the hospital saying that she felt very sick and saying that things were going downhill. But SEL was confused because she said that Betty was a very healthy person. SEL had also been receiving text messages from Connor who told her that Betty was suffering from HLH even before they had any official diagnosis. Then another one of Betty's friends spoke with police and she told them that the relationship between Connor and Betty wasn't as good as they would want people to believe. This friend told investigators that their marriage was going down the drain due to infidelity issues. She said that Betty had discussed divorce and it seemed that this is where they were headed if they couldn't fix their issues. The same friend told investigators that after Betty's death, Connor informed her that he had a life insurance policy out on Betty and that he was set to collect $500,000 in life insurance. 
This was concerning to the friend because Betty had previously told her that Connor was in a lot of debt. That's kind of what happens when you go to medical school or go to school in general. A lot of people will have a lot of debt from undergrad, but then add doctorate school or medical school or whatever to that, you're going to be in even more debt. So, Connor was in so much debt that the two had to keep two separate bank accounts to keep their finances separate because, you know, when you're married, the whole debt thing becomes a big issue and Connor had a lot of it. So, the fact that not only was Connor trying to get her autopsy canceled, the fact that he wanted her cremated so quickly, that their marriage was not in a good place and he benefited financially from her death, that made investigators raise an eyebrow at Connor. So, they quickly denied the request to cancel the autopsy and they started looking into Connor. So, it turned out that while Betty was in the hospital, hospital staff noticed that Connor had used his hospital credentials because, again, he worked for the Mayo Clinic, she was at the Mayo Clinic. He used his credentials to access Betty's patient account. Given that he was not a part of her medical team and was not a part of her treatment, it was against HIPAA regulations for Connor to have looked into her medical records without her permission. Now, Betty did give him permission on the 16th, but this access was terminated on the 20th when she died. So, between the 16th and the 20th, he was allowed to look at her records. But after that, he was not allowed to because, again, he was not a part of her death, he was not a part of her treatment, there was no reason that he needed to be looking into what was going on with her records. So, police were able to get a search warrant to look into the data relating to Connor's online activity around the time of Betty's death. They found that from August 16th through August 20th, Connor checked Betty's electronic medical records, or EMR, several times. He looked at her admissions information, reviewed the doctor's and nursing notes, checked her allergies, and read the log from the operating room from when she got surgery. But then from August 20th through August 23rd, when he did not have permission to be looking into her records, Connor checked her medical records daily. On the 22nd, he actually modified her medical records. Reports say that Connor created a documentation encounter record but he did not add anything to it. But because he created documentation in her case, he was listed as a part of Betty's care team. This allowed him to look into her medical records without entering his credentials. From August 23rd through August 31st, he looked at different images, medication lists, nursing and doctor notes, and other encounter notes on Betty's EMR. Some of this might sound confusing to those of you who do not work in healthcare, but basically, if you are not caring for a patient, like let's say one of my coworkers has a patient and I'm not seeing them, they're not on my schedule, there's no reason for me to be looking into their record other than maybe I'm just curious, that is not allowed, I do not have permission to do that. If they were on my schedule and I created a note for them, like my daily encounter for them or an initial evaluation for them, then I am listed as a part of their healthcare team. So, what Connor did was he went into her records, her case, and added a note of some sort. He didn't add anything to the note, but he probably signed off on it or I don't know how their system works, but he might not even had to have signed off on it. He might have just had to create it. And then that added him as a part of her care team, so it didn't flag anything when he looked at her records. As police continued their investigation, by September 29th, a witness from the University of Kansas contacted police to let them know her suspicions. She told police about Connor's work as a poison specialist and his role as a poison control employee. He was someone who would answer your calls regarding poisons, and in this role, he would basically tell the person on the other end if they needed to seek medical care. So, your kid swallows something, you're worried about what they just swallowed, you call poison control, you say, hey, my kid just ingested this, what do I do? And Connor is that person that would tell you what to do on the other end of the phone call. Now, the university also informed the police that part of Connor's residency was research. That is very standard. I believe pretty much any doctorate or medical or PhD will involve research to some capacity. It turned out that Connor was a part of a team that was researching a drug called colchicine. Colchicine is a drug used to prevent gout attacks, which is basically characterized as sudden, severe joint pain caused by high levels of uric acid in the blood. 
Colchicine can also be used to relieve pain in patients who already are suffering from gout-related pain. The university wanted to note that at no point in their recent history has their poison control center received any calls regarding colchicine. I will come back to this in just a minute. Now, in addition to looking at his work access, police were able to get a warrant to search Connor's personal electronic devices. In that search, police obtained his University of Kansas HP laptop. This was a device that he used because of his job as a poison control specialist. This computer has a VPN authentication process so that only he is able to use his laptop because again, it is his work laptop and nobody else is supposed to be using it or looking at what's on it. So it's pretty much confirmed that Connor was the only person who could have used this laptop. Police found that on his laptop, Connor had researched the following things. On August 5th, 2023, Connor searched, internet browsing history, can it be used in court? Police track package delivery and delete Amazon data police. Later that same day, Connor searched for a VPN, which can be used to hide someone online internet activity. Some people use it for private browsing. Some people use VPNs to protect their privacy. Some people use it to change their location data so they can, let's say, watch British TV shows in the US and things like that but some people might use them to prevent law enforcement from finding their internet history. In addition to this, Connor made searches for sodium nitrate. Sodium nitrate is most commonly used by adding it to processed and cured meats to extend shelf lights, give them flavor, and give them a pink color. In small amounts, it is perfectly fine for consumption and is permitted for use under the US Food and Drug Administration. However, if overconsumed, it can have detrimental effects. Sodium nitrate has been proven to cause negative effects on oxygen circulation in the blood, basically limiting how your body can circulate oxygen, which can lead to methemoglobinemia, which is life-threatening disruption of oxygen-carrying capacity of hemoglobin. So, after searching for sodium nitrate on his computer, Connor went to a Google Shop page for various vendors selling sodium nitrate. By August 10th, Connor made the search food versus industrial grade sodium nitrate. Then he read a scientific journal which discussed the lethality of sodium nitrate. Then Connor did an online conversion of Betty's weight from pounds to kilograms. When it comes to scientific journals and knowing the proper amounts of medications and things like that, we typically use kilograms for those conversions. Even though in the US we use the imperial system, most of the rest of the world uses the metric system, and in science we use the metric system as well. So it made sense that if Connor was trying to find a lethal dose of something for Betty, he would convert her weight from pounds to kilograms. Once he had her weight in kilograms, he multiplied her weight by 0 0.8. On August 10th and 11th, Connor made a search for liquid colchicine on a website, GoodRx. Then he visited a website called stripe.com, which is a website that helps with online purchases. The timing of Connor searching for colchicine and sodium nitrate coincided with him visiting stripe.com, so police believe that he purchased both substances on the 11th, five days before Betty fell sick. Like I said, Connor used an online tool to convert Betty's weight in kilograms and then multiplied that by 0.8, and it just so happens that the lethal dose of colchicine is 0.8 milligrams per kilogram of body weight. And again, as we know from Betty's text messages, she was drinking with Connor right before she felt ill. So if you kind of connect the dots here, it seems like Connor figured out the lethal dose of colchicine, made a drink for Betty, put the colchicine in it, and that is when she fell ill. That is what the theory is. At this time, police also got a search warrant to search Connor's home, and in his home, they found a bank receipt showing that he had just deposited $450,000 into his bank account. So he already got that payout from his wife's death. Now, as police were conducting their searches, the medical examiner's office was working to get Betty's autopsy and toxicology screens run. Based on the blood and urine samples, they found that there was colchicine present in Betty's system at the time of her death. 
upon looking into her medical records and obviously using the autopsy to figure out her cause of death, it was found that Betty did not have gout, so there was no reason that she should have been taking colchicine. She was also found to have not died from HLH, like originally thought. They found that Betty had never once been prescribed colchicine by any medical professional, nor had she been administered any at the hospital. Of course, while Betty was at the hospital, the blood work was probably not tested for colchicine because there was no reason for this to be in her system. But after this was found in her toxicology report, they went back and tested her blood sample from the hospital since this would give a better idea of how much colchicine was in her system at the time of her admission. It turned out that she didn't quite have a lethal dose, but this sample was taken 24 hours after her onset of symptoms, and the medical examiner noted that this drug does metabolize very quickly. So, while they can't say exactly how much was in her system to make her ill, her having it in her system to begin with is very concerning. This isn't something that naturally occurs in your body, like if someone found a lot of melatonin in your system, for example, they could say, like, this does naturally occur in your body, and maybe this person just has elevated levels of melatonin, for example, but colchicine is never something that should be in your system if you are not actively taking it. It's not something that she should have had any access to, it was not prescribed to her, she did not have gout, so it should not have been in her system at all. So, based on what they found, the medical examiner ruled that Betty's cause of death was actually the result of the toxic effects of colchicine, and he ruled that her manner of death was homicide. So, based on all of the evidence that we have discussed up until this point, police believe that Betty did not die of natural causes. She was murdered, and everything police found pointed directly at Connor Bowman. So, by October 20th, 2023, just a week or two by the time I'm recording this, Connor Bowman was arrested and charged with the second-degree murder of his wife, Betty Bowman. He pleaded not guilty, and he was given a $5 million bail without conditions or a $2 million bail with conditions. As of right now, he has not yet posted bail and remains in jail to await his trial. So, that is all of the information that we know as of right now. Obviously, for the family, this is a very tragic and heartbreaking and confusing loss. The fact that she went to the hospital and died so suddenly with everybody thinking that it was natural causes, only to find out that her husband, who she loved so much, might have been the one responsible. Obviously, he is innocent until proven guilty, but as of right now, it is not looking good for him. I think if he did kill Betty, it was for financial gain. I think if the statements are true regarding their relationship going down the tanks, it makes sense that he would want her out of the picture, especially since he got $500,000 from it. That can definitely pay off his medical school debts and prevent the expensive costs that come with divorce. So, I think that's probably why he did it if he is the one responsible for her murder, because again, he is still innocent as of right now. In the wake of this news, Betty's family has set up a GoFundMe to help pay for the costs that they know will come with this whole situation now that they found out that this may not have been a natural death. The GoFundMe states, quote, as new evidence emerges, we realize that Betty may have been taken from us not by natural causes. Because of this, I am taking donations for Nancy, Betty's mother, and her family to help assist with legal costs and transportation to Rochester, memorial costs, meals, bills, and anything else that can help make things just a little bit easier while they grieve. Betty adored her mom, and I know that she would want her and her family to be taken care of during this difficult time. As of right now, the GoFundMe is very close to achieving its goal, so if you have any money to spare, even if it's only a dollar, anything can help if we all work together to donate. I know that this must be the most devastating thing for a family to go through. I know that Betty's family has a very, very long road ahead of them, so if we can do anything to help ease that burden just a little bit by helping the family with their finances, I know it will make a huge difference. I will be donating to the GoFundMe myself, so I encourage you all to do the same, and it will be listed down below. But yeah, that is all of the information that I have on today's case. 
I know that this is a very recent case and we don't know all of the information yet, but I imagine as the investigation continues, we will find out more about the relationship that Betty and Connor had, as well as more evidence that can take them in the right direction. As with all of these recent cases that I've been covering for the past few weeks, as soon as I know more information about this case, I will let you all know, whether it be by updating the description box or through an update video, but that is all of the information that I have for you all today, and now I want to know what you all think. Do you think police will be able to find enough to convict Connor? Do you think they already have enough? Do you think that Connor is even guilty? If not, why do you think? If so, what do you think the motive was here? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn that notification bell to you on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. All will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill up the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.